Hello, I'm Phoenix City Council Member Carlos Garcia with District 8. We will never replace in-person teaching, but during these trying times, our children still need to continue to learn. The City of Phoenix is proud to partner with both the Osborne and Roosevelt School Districts to bring you Phoenix TV Classroom Study Hall. Youth and education is a priority for Phoenix. That's why the city is bringing you the study hall to your home during this next hour right here on Phoenix TV. Learning should never stop, so get ready for class. Here's the study hall. Mrs. Fletcher here, second grade teacher at Solano Elementary School in the Osborne School District. I'm so excited to be here today. We're going to talk about some social emotional learning and social is like with our friends and our families and emotional is how we feel, you know, maybe how we're feeling all for a long time or how we're feeling just in one little moment. So we have some real fun things that we're gonna keep those ideas uh, in our minds today when we work together. So first, what I want to do is I want to do a little bit of a, a warm-up exercise that is some push-pull breathing. And it's really cool. Uh, we use this in our class when we're feeling a little frustrated, right? We're a little frustrated or we're a little angry, or sometimes when we're getting ready to take a test um, or before we speak before our class. And this is our push-pull breathing. So you're gonna use your hands and you're gonna use your nose and you're gonna use your mouth. Okay, and we're gonna do this three times. Ready? Try this with me, it's great, you can do it. You can do it standing up, you can do it sitting down, it's perfect. Here we go, ready? Breathe in, two, three, breathe out. See how you push, breathe in, breathe out. And then last time, breathe in, pull, breathe out. Cool. Alrighty. Thanks for doing that with me. I really like our push pull breathing. It's nice. All right. So today we're going to talk about five different areas that our friends at Sanford Harmony like to work with uh, kids and adults on when they're talking and when they're listening and when they're playing and when they are working with their friends. So we're gonna go ahead and check out those five areas. And we wanna keep those areas in mind when we're reading our books today. So let's check those out. Look at our fun post-it notes. This way we can focus on one area at a time. So our first area, thank you, Sanford Harmony, that we're gonna talk about today is diversity and inclusion. Now diversity, you can find diversity with people, you can find diversity with pets, and you can define diversity with foods. It means that not everything's the same, that there's different ways to do things. So there's different ways to be boys, there's different ways to be girls, there's different ways to do a lot of things as well. Inclusion means that no matter if you're different, that we're gonna work and include all of our friends in what we're doing. We're trying to bring people together. That's inclusion. That's great. The next area we're gonna look at under our orange notes here is we're gonna look at empathy and critical thinking. Empathy is when you are feeling how another person feels. You're trying to understand where they're coming from. Um, you're being, you're showing empathy or being empathetic to maybe, you know, your friend's experiencing a problem and you're trying to understand how they could feel and how you could help them critically think about the situation, right? Critical thinking is when we're trying not to just immediately rush in and, and fix it. We have to think about all the different pieces. 
Maybe our friend's just upset in the moment. Maybe we're just upset in the moment. And we need to just take some of those breaths and kind of wait and think about what happened and maybe what we could do differently. That leads in to another section in a little bit. But before that happens, we need to have some communication. We need to talk with not only our friends, but with ourselves. Yeah, we can talk with ourselves. We can do listening skills, really try to hear what the other person is saying and understand that maybe people are communicating with us, not by speaking, but by their actions. You know, sometimes when people want to take a, a little break, you know, it's because they just want to be by themselves and there isn't a problem. And sometimes they need to take a little break because they need to think through kind of where, where they are. Okay. So communication is making good patterns, you know, sharing how you're feeling, how you're really feeling, not pretending to be something else or somebody else in order to be included with everybody. This all ties into our problem solving, right? Doesn't this sound like we were already starting to problem solve? When we start thinking about how it's good to be diverse, how it's good to be more than one way, um, we start to be inclusive, right? We start to include people. We start to understand how they're feeling with our showing empathy. And we start to think critically about different situations. Then our communication, the way that we listen and the way that we speak is affected. We do have two ears and one mouth so that we can do more listening than speaking. And really, we have two eyes to see what other people are doing, too, before we share all of our words as well. This all helps with our problem solving and, and seeing what else we can do, which then affects our peer relationships, right? Our peer relationships means our friends and our families, the people around us. So with those things in mind, I want to share a story with you. And this story talks about somebody, and maybe you felt like this before, where they're not quite sure if they're included because they do feel like they're not like anybody else. They don't have any value, like they're just worth nothing. Sad day. Let's check this book out. It's called Zero by Catherine Otoshi. Ooh, look at this color black. It's nice with a silver zero. Ooh, silver. Okay. Zero by Catherine Otoshi. Zero was a big round number. When she looked at herself, she just saw a hole right in her center. Every day she watched the numbers line up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. She wanted to count too. But how could a number worth nothing become something? Zero felt empty inside. She watched one having fun with the others. One was solid and strong with bold strokes and square corners. Zero was big and round with no corners at all. If I were like one, then I could count two, she thought. So she pushed and pulled, she stretched and straightened, she forced and flattened, and finally became zero. She sighed. <sighs> Becoming like one was too much of a stretch. Eight and nine rolled into the scene. If you doubled yourself up, you could be like me, said eight. So zero twist and turn to try to be like eight. Or you could be nine with a longer line, said nine. So zero pinched and puckered to try to be nine. But zero could only be zero. We're on our way to join the others. Come 
count with us, they said. Zero felt deflated. Like a balloon without any air. Deflated. Eight and nine were numbers with value. Of course they'd count. How could they know how she felt? Zero had a new thought. If she could impress the numbers, that'd give her value. She'd leap, she'd soar, she'd sizzle, she'd shine. She'd make a grand entrance and floor them all. Zero began to roll faster and faster and faster. She leaped, flying, soaring, rocketing right into one who knocked over two who fell into three and four toppling five and six who crashed into seven and eight where they all ended up in a big pile on nine the numbers were all bent out of shape uh, uh. i'm not happy it's no use trying sobbed zero i'll never have value I'll never be part of the count, she said. It's what's inside that counts. Most, pointed out Seven. Zero looked at herself. But what if I don't have anything inside? Every number has value, said Seven. Be open. You'll find a way. Suddenly, Zero saw herself in a new light. I'm not empty inside. I'm open. Zero rolled up to the other to the numbers. I've thought of a way for us to count even more, she said. Count more? asked four. Count us in, exclaimed seven. Lead the way, said one. Everyone counts, the numbers shouted. Zero jumped in. Then she leaped up high and said, here's something new we can try. If we help each other soar, we can count even more. Let's count again, starting with 10. Oh, look at one, but the zero behind it counts more. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and what's next? 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. We do count more, they cheered. Zero and the numbers explored and had fun, bringing more value to everyone. Wow, look at all those numbers. 74 becomes 740. <gasps> Four becomes 40. Wow, this is great. And this time when she looked at herself, she felt whole. Not like a whole, but all together. Right in her center. B and zero. Oh, friends, she didn't have to be nothing. She was something all along. Let's look at our chart here. So zero was diverse, right? All the numbers are different. And then she got to be included. Seven, what he was starting to feel like, hey, you still have value. He was feeling that, you know, he understood that she didn't, feel like she had anything, that she had to look and be open. Sometimes you have to be open to who you are and be your own best friend first before you find it in other people, right? That's kind of critical thinking. And the way they talked about it, and then Zero really kind of was talking a lot to herself. She was saying, hey, wait a second. I don't have to look at myself like this. I can look at myself like this. That became part of her problem solving. She learned not to be down about herself, but to bring what her own specialness was to the numbers, which affected her peer relationships. That made all the numbers shine when Zero realized who she was and that her difference, her diversity is what really made everything work so much better.
pretty cool. Zero, not nothing. So my friends, before we go today, I want to ask you a question. And sometimes we'll ask these questions in the beginning and sometimes we'll ask them in the middle and sometimes we'll ask them in the end. Sometimes it's good to ask a question to think about and listen to what others get to tell you so that you can learn about their diversity. So here's my question to you. Which musical instrument do you think would best describe your personality? This is from my chat pack with kids. Which musical instrument do you think would best describe your personality, who you are? All right, let's try our push-pull breathing right now while we think about that question, ready? Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. I'm thinking about sharing what type of musical instrument I am with you. Breathe in, breathe out. Friends, I'm gonna tell you a secret. I'm not one kind of musical instrument. Sometimes I feel like a kazoo. When I wanna get stuff done. Other times, there's things that I have to stay on beat and be done a certain way, like a drum. And other times, I'm like a cello. Right before bed, I think about my day. I think about where I'm going. Hmm. Hmm. And I think about what I'd like to do later. Hmm. Most of all, that I don't have to do anything else but just rest. So I'm like three musical instruments, maybe more. What about you? I know so many great ideas, right? Think about this. Ask your friends and family. Share with them. Include them. Ask them. Communicate. All right, friends, this has been some great time together with our social and emotional learning together. I love it. It's so fun. It's a nice time. Let's say goodbye to our friends in English and Spanish and sign language. Here we go. Adios, amigos. Adios, amigos. Adios, amigos. Es tiempo de decir adios. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye, friends. It's time to say goodbye. Ah, oh, it's great. I really like this time together and I can't wait for next week. This is awesome. Thanks so much for sharing your time with me. Thanks so much for thinking and wondering with me. This is Mrs. Fletcher, second grade teacher at Solano Elementary in Osborne School District, signing off saying, I will see you next time. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mrs. Davey and I am a dual language kindergarten teacher in the Osborne District at Solano School. Go Tigers! Something interesting about me is that I love words. Words help me talk with the people who are important to me. Words are awesome because they help me tell others what I'm thinking and feeling. Words help me understand the ideas and feelings of other people too. If you watched last week, you may remember the book we read together. If you remember the book, you can clap your hands together for a count of five. Ready? Clap your hands if you remember our book from last week. All right, friends, let's catch our hands and get them ready so that we can listen. Last week, the book we read together was The Word Collector by Peter H. Reynolds. We heard about Jerome. Do you remember what Jerome liked to collect? That's right, he liked to collect words like dream and Peace. Jerome loved words probably as much as I love words. 
Today, you will hear another story by Peter H. Reynolds. Say Something is about how we can share our feelings or our ideas by using words and actions. Before we begin our book, I have some reading strategies to share with you. When I read, sometimes I realize that I haven't understood the words. Does that ever happen to you? Yeah, all readers lose track of what they're reading sometimes, even your teacher. Did you know that readers can fix their comprehension when it breaks down? Readers can ask questions, they can reread, they can keep reading, they can stop and think about the text features like the bold words or the picture or illustration or even if there's a page heading. And if they're still confused, they can talk to another person like a classmate or a teacher. Today, I will show you how I fix my comprehension when it breaks down. I'll need your help. Will you please watch and listen to me read and help me with my fix-up strategies? Say Something by Peter H. Reynolds. Say something. Oh, they're saying something with their words and their signs. Written and illustrated by Peter H. Reynolds. Wow, look at all of those speech bubbles. I see lots of words. Hey, there's the word peace. Say something by Peter Hamilton Reynolds. The world needs your voice. Mine? Yes, yours. Go ahead. It doesn't need to be perfect as long as it's from your heart. You don't have to be loud. Powerful words can be a whisper. You can say something in so many ways with words, with action, with creativity. If you see someone lonely, say something by just being there for them. What a good friend. If you see an empty canvas, hmm, the author says, canvas. What does that mean? I'm not sure. So I'm going to use the text features to help me. I'm going to look at this illustration. Now it says empty canvas and this white rectangle is empty. So I'm wondering if this is the canvas, but what is a canvas for? I think I'm going to keep reading and see if that helps me make sense of the word canvas. Say something with your brush. Oh, the girl is using her brush and some paint and she's going to paint on that white rectangle. So I wonder if a canvas is something that you paint on. I think that's right. If you see an empty lot, say something by planting a seed and watching it bloom. If you see someone being hurt, say something by being brave. Hey, stop! If you see something beautiful, say something with a poem. Painted meadow splashed with rainbows. If you have a brilliant idea, say something with confidence. 
Eureka! She came up with a good idea. If you want to show the world who you are, say something with style. Ta-da! Look at those boots. If you are angry, say something to help people understand. You made me feel invisible. That really hurt. I'm really sorry. Have you ever felt angry? If you have, you can give me a me too. Yeah. When you were angry, were you able to help people understand by saying something? Sometimes it's hard to be calm enough to say something when you're feeling really, really angry. When I feel really, really angry, I need to stop and take some balloon breaths like this. Pretty silly, right? Taking a balloon breath or a few balloon breaths helps me to calm down so that I'm able to say something to the person or people who have made me feel angry. We can practice for the next time that we feel really, really angry. Take some balloon breaths with me now. Put our hands together, put them over our head, and we breathe in and our hands go up like we're inflating a balloon. And then we let the air out and we make a big blubbery noise like the air is coming out of the balloon. Let's try it again. One more. I feel much better when I get some of that extra oxygen up in my brain. It helps me feel calm. If you see an injustice, say something peacefully. Inspire others to do the same. No more hurting people. Peace. Oh, wow, look at all of these other signs. Huh, those are pretty cool. None of them are the same. There are some things that are similar, though. Wait a minute. I need to stop and think about the text features. Would you please help me? Let's take a closer look at the illustrations and words. What do you see? Oh, okay. All these other people are holding signs too but I can't read all of them. Can you read any of the signs? Yeah, I see some marks and symbols that I don't know. I can read this sign. It says, no more hurting people. Peace. Hmm. It has this symbol too. Now, I wonder, could this symbol mean peace? Where do we see the same symbol? Yeah, we see it here and here. Oh, here we see it and we see it here. Oh, it's even inside the letter P up here in this word. Huh. Well, this sign says peace, and so does this one and this one. So it makes me wonder, could these other signs mean peace too? What do you think? Yeah, 
the author says, inspire others to do the same. And this boy was sharing this sign that said, no more hurting people, peace. I wonder if he inspired these other people to make their signs. I bet these other signs probably mean peace too. Thank you for helping me talk that out. Sometimes you'll say something and no one will be listening, but keep saying what is in your heart and you will find someone who listens. Keep saying it and you may be surprised to find the whole world listening. Oh, wow, that is a lot of birds. If you are grateful for being alive, quietly say something to the stars, to the universe. Some people find it easier to say something than others, but everyone has something to say. Wow, these people all have something to say. I wish, together we can. I'm ready to change the world, I imagine. So when you're ready, say something. Your voice can inspire, heal, and transform. Your voice can change the world. Are you ready to say something? Peter Hamilton Reynolds. The world needs your voice. I hope you enjoyed Say Something. Let's practice last week's strategy now to help us think about the book. Last week, we learned to visualize. So I want you to close your eyes and visualize your favorite page of our book today. Okay, get your eyes closed. I'm gonna give you some think time. Make that picture up in your mind. Try to see it up in your mind and give me a thumbs up when you have that picture of your favorite part of today's book. All right, we're going to open our eyes again when I get to one, all right? Three, two, one. Open your eyes. Now, try to keep that picture that you visualized in your mind. How does it make you feel? Today, we used fix-up strategies to help us understand the story when our comprehension broke down. First, I asked myself the question about a word I didn't know. I used the text features like the word empty and the white rectangle here and the picture here of the girl and her brush and the paint. And I used those text features to help me figure out that a canvas is something you paint on. Then we stopped to think about the signs people were holding. Finally, you helped me ask and answer questions about the signs and we figured out that they probably all say something about peace. We also practiced our balloon breaths to help us get calm when we feel angry. Every one of us 
no matter how big or small, has a voice. We can use words, actions, or creativity to tell the world what we feel or think. Our voice can make the world a better place. I hope you will use your voice because your voice is powerful and you can make our world a better place. Be kind, be brave, most of all, be you. We love you just the way you are. Your voice matters to me and it matters to your teachers. Your voice matters to your family and your community. Your voice matters. I wish you well and I look forward to reading to you again next week. Until then, stay well. Good morning, students. I'm Michael Roberts, superintendent of the Osborne School District in Central Phoenix. And I'm Quentin Boy, superintendent of the Roosevelt School District in South Phoenix. We're pleased to have this partnership with the City of Phoenix to take Phoenix students on a new learning adventure right here on Phoenix TV. Just because our school buildings are closed doesn't mean the learning stops. We have the best, most creative teachers from Roosevelt and Osborne School Districts on board to provide you with a great learning experience. Okay, students, that's the bell. So the Phoenix TV Study Hall resumes. Here's your next lesson. Hi, everyone. My name is Mrs. Herskovici, and I'm a first grade teacher at Encanto School. Today, I'm going to read you a nonfiction story called Then and Now. Nonfiction means that it's a story about real things. So today, we're going to be looking at photographs about a little boy and photographs from his grandmother when she was a little girl. I'm going to slide my picture over so we can see the story nice and big. And when I'm not teaching at Encanto School, I like to read books and I also like to watch movies. So I thought this would be a really special way to do both of those at the same time, where we read a story together and you get to watch me read it. So it's kind of like watching a movie. Now, before we read our story, I wanna to talk to you about my super special big idea light bulb, it's right here. And our big question for today, how do key details help me learn about the things that are the same for the little boy and his grandmother? So when we read our story today, we're gonna to see this big idea light bulb and it's gonna help us answer some questions while we're reading. Okay, let's go to the next page. Here is my diary. I write in it every day. My grandma gave me her diary. She wrote in it every day when she was little like I am. I like to look at what she wrote when she was little like I am. I like to look at her pictures too. So. I know that this is a picture of grandma when she was a little girl. And because it's a black and white photograph, it's a good clue for me to know in my brain that this is happening in the past. Let's go to our next page. My grandma wrote, we got a new car today. This is what it looks like. There's her car. It's in black and white. So I know that this is an old picture from the past. I wrote, here I am by our car. I like to ride in it. Here's the little boy, and this picture is happening in the present. They're the same because they both have cars. Let's go to the next page. There's our super special big idea bubble. Let's go ahead and read the words in our story first, and then we'll answer our big idea question. My grandma wrote, I went to a baseball game. It was so much fun. This is what it looked like. There's the photograph from when she was a little girl. I wrote, today I went to a baseball game. My team won. And here's the little boy's photograph. Okay, big idea. How are the little boy and the grandmother the same? What makes them the same in these two pages? Hmm. You're right, they both went to a baseball game. I can tell that because the photographs are both baseball games and in the text, I read the word baseball game 
for grandma's page and baseball game for the little boy's page. That makes them the same. I'm gonna go to the next page. My grandma wrote, here is a picture of my teacher in my class at school. So here's grandma's photograph. I wrote, we did puzzles at school today. We all had fun. Well, I know they're different because grandma is writing in her journal with her friends at school. And the little boy is playing with puzzles in his classroom at his school. They're different because they're not doing the same thing. Hmm, do you see puzzles like that in your classroom? I do too. We use these puzzles to help us make shapes in my classroom at Encanto School. Let's go to the next page. There's our big idea light bulb. My grandma wrote, we are going far away today. We have to take a big ship to get there. This is what it looks like. Oh, that is a really big ship. Have you ever been on a ship before? I bet it would be a lot of fun. I wrote, we are going on a trip. We are going far away. We have to fly to get there. Hmm, my big idea light bulb is right here, which means we need to think about how they are the same. But the pictures look different. I wonder, do you know how grandma and the little boy are the same on these two pages in our story? Hmm. Let me go back to our text. We are going far away today. I think I read that over. We are going far away. They both went far away, even though grandma was in a ship and the little boy was in a plane. They both went on a trip. Now, this was a little bit tricky. I hope you are ready to help me when we get to the end of our story. Keep these pictures in your brain. They will be important. My grandma wrote, I went to the beach today. Here's the picture I took at the beach. I wrote, I like to play at the beach. I like to play in the sand. Okay, big idea. I want you to think in your brain, how are these the same? How are the little boy and grandma the same? Think about it. Think about it. You're right, they both went to the beach. That's how they're the same. Great job, everyone. Let's go to the next page. My grandma wrote, here is a picture of our radio. I like to listen to it. And I wrote, my mom, dad, and I watch TV today. I like to watch TV. Radio, TV, not the same. They are different. I went to see my grandma today. We looked at her diary and then we looked at my diary. It was fun to look at them. So here's grandma and the little boy and they're both sharing a memory together where they're reading his diary. That was a nice story. And this was the end of our read aloud today. But I have one more surprise for you. Here is our big idea one more time. I told you it was gonna come back. How do key details help me learn about the things that are the same for the little boy and his grandmother? And here is our tree map. First graders love tree maps. On this branch of our tree map, I have the word same. And on this branch, I have the word different. And on these pictures, I wrote some special words that were part of our big idea to help us sort them in the right spot. Okay, going to the beach. Can you point to what side I should put this on in my tree map? Should I put it on same or different? You're right, you pointed to the side that says same. It was the same for grandma and the little boy. They both went to the beach. Okay, going to a baseball game. Is it the same for little boy and grandma or was it different? 
Did you point to the side that says the same? I know you did. It was the same. They both went to a baseball game. Okay, here's that tricky one. Remember how we solved that problem and we talked about the grandma went on a trip in a ship and the little boy went on a trip in a plane? Hmm, where should I slide this picture? Are they the same or are they different? You pointed to different, you're right. It was different for grandma to go in a ship and the little boy to go in a plane. Great job helping me sort these pictures in our tree map. Well, boys and girls, that was the end of our story and our tree map activity. I wish you well. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Remember, I'm Mrs. Herskovici. I teach first grade and I just read you a story. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. This week in our reading strategy, we're gonna use the fix-up strategies. Now remember, the fix-up strategies is a collection of strategies that we use because we wanna fix up our comprehension of the text. So, if it is a whole story, we will use these particular strategies. We may have to back up and reread something to make sure we read it correctly. We may have to cross-check our meaning after we read it. Does this make sense in this sentence? Also, retelling and reviewing the story really helps a lot with our comprehension. Sometimes you may be reading way too fast and you may have to adjust your reading, slow it down a little bit so that you can comprehend what you're reading. Also, don't forget, if it is a nonfiction text, use your text features. That will also help you understand what the main ideal of the text is. And also, stop and think after you've read a paragraph or maybe two. What is this story about? What is it trying to tell you? What does the author want you to know? The strategies though that we're going to focus on are the strategies that are just for one word or one collection of words specifically. So don't forget if there is a word that you don't know. The best strategy is to use the best strategy. The B stands for break it apart. Break the word apart. Sounding it out, chunking it up. The E is for examine. After you've broken the word apart and examined the parts, see if some of them look familiar to you. The S is for say the words and the word parts. See if you can figure out if you're saying them correctly. Do they make sense? And then the T is to think about it. Think about what you've broken apart Think about the sounds that you hear and think about if you can come up with a word that makes sense in that sentence, that that is that word. Next, look for prefixes and suffixes when you break it apart. That will help you break apart those chunks and sound it out. Our strategy that we're going to use, though, for this text is to use some context clues. So I'm going to put a star here because we are going to use context clues within our story to help us figure out what the author is saying to us, to help us understand what the author is trying to tell us. The other strategy that we're going to use is we're going to replace some of the words that may be too hard for us to understand with words that we do understand. So these are the two strategies that we're going to focus on on this text. There are some other strategies as well. If there are words that you cannot say or pronounce, don't forget, you can always skip it and come back later. And if you still can't figure out how to say it, what it means, there is always a dictionary, or in our case, we have, we're using a nonfiction non text that has a glossary that will help us with defining the words. So this week, and we're still focusing on science and engineering, we're going to read about Nikola Tesla. Tesla was an extraordinary inventor. He was an extraordinary engineer. Engineers are people who make things. They solve problems by making things that help us solve our problem. And we're going to see what Nikola Tesla did that is a problem-solving activity. And we're also going to do a science activity after we read about Nikola Tesla. 
All right, all you science people, enjoy the story. Hello, scholars. Today, we're going to read the book called The Power of Wind by Michael Sandler. Today's focus in our reading will be how have people used wind to power things? And think about how engineers have used wind to solve problems. We're going to use a fix-up strategy. So the two that we're going to focus on is using context clues and also replacing with uh, another word. So we're going to see if there's some words in here that we don't know that we can use to replace those other words. Words that we need to know. Our vocabulary words are air pressure, Compresses, generator, harnessed, inventions, natural resource, object, turbine, and windmills. Let's review the parts of a book. So we do have our table of contents, which tells us the name of our chapters and the page each chapter is found on. Also, don't forget, we have a glossary in case those vocabulary words that we just reviewed, if we don't know them, we can go to the glossary and look up the meaning. But we can also use our fix it up strategy and we can use context clues to see if we can figure out what those words mean. The first sailor. More than 5,000 years ago, a person took cloth and attached it to the mast of a boat. The wind caught the sail. It pushed the ship forward, sending it across the water. For the first time, people had harnessed the power of wind. It was just the beginning. Today, we use wind power just about every for everything, from computers to cars. And if you look at our text feature, right here at the bottom, there is a picture. It's an ancient carving. It's a marble carving. It was found in Carthage when it shows a small Roman ship with two masts, and those are the sails. What is wind? The wind can be our friend. It cools us off in the hot summer days and allows us to fly, kites high in the sky. The wind can also cause great damage, downing power lines, trees, and even buildings. This moving air is mainly caused by the differences in the air pressure, which in turn is due to the differences in temperature. Warm air rises and spreads out. This is known as low pressure. Cold air, on the other hand, sinks and compresses. This is known as high pressure. Air moves from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure across the planet. This creates the wind. Down here at the bottom, you have a diagram. It shows cool air sinking, and it creates high pressure. The wind direction, it comes over this way, and as it warms in the sun, it creates low pressure because the air rises. We have a vocabulary here, word here, compresses. If something compresses, I'm not real sure what that means, but if I look at this picture, it says that cold air, on the other hand, sinks and compresses. So it looks like to me that this cold air is moving toward the ground. So maybe it gets lower and lower and lower. And because it can't move, because the ground doesn't move, it compresses it. So compresses means that it pushes it. I think that's what it means. It pushes it closer and closer to the ground. But as the ground heats it, you create the high pressure or the lower pressure here and it rises. So high pressure is compressed. Low pressure, it rises. The air in a balloon, for an example, is under high pressure. The air on the out, higher pressure than the air on the outside is. When you let the air out of the balloon, the air rushes out into the area of low pressure. That's wind. So if I feel my cheeks, and I push the air out, it's high pressure on the inside, 
and it wants to get to the lower pressure on the outside. Hmm, okay. Areas of high and low pressure are always moving and changing as the Earth spins and moves around the sun. Usually, the greater difference in pressure between two areas uh, makes a, the wind faster. The wind blows. So let me go back and reread that. Usually, the greater the difference in the air pressure, the pressure between two areas, the faster the wind blows. Hmm. Here it says tornadoes and hurricanes. Pressure differences are the most extreme during tornadoes and hurricanes. These storms can create unbelievably powerful winds. Hurricanes can produce winds that blow more than 322 kilometers per hour, which that equals 200 miles per hour. Tornado winds can reach up to 483 kilometers per hour. That is 300 miles per hour. Hmm. Now, I know when I drive to school, I start out really slow at about 20 because I'd be in my neighborhood. And then as I go onto the main street, my car will travel 45 miles per hour. That's still a lot different than 200 and 300 miles per hour. That's really fast. Sailboats. Sailboats are, very, are the first important use of wind power. Early sailboats were simple ships with a, simple, with a single sail. Wind power only helped people travel in one direction, the direction the wind is blowing. In time, people learned to use sailboats to travel against the wind. They built ships with many sails that could travel long distances. People used sailboats for fishing, trading, exploration, and war. Sails powered the battleships of ancient Greece. They helped the Vikings travel to Europe, Africa, and to North America. If we look at our diagram, our picture here, it has a picture of a Viking ship with a sail, and it looks like the wind is blowing into the sail and pushing the boat. The Vikings who ruled Scandinavia almost 300 years ago were warriors at sea, so that means that they used their sailboats for war. Hmm. Interesting. In the 1500s, explorers used massive ships with sails to travel the globe. People coming to the Americas also used these types of ships. In time, engines replaced sails as the main way to power ships. Today, people still sail for fun. And if we look at our diagram here, it says Magellan's Journey. Magellan's expedition, the first to sail around the world, left Spain in 1519 and returned in 1522. Magellan did not complete the voyage himself, but his expedition set the stage for future exploration. So if we look at Magellan's journey, he left Spain, which is here, in 1519, and he sailed, and the arrow will show you where he sailed. He sailed around Africa into the West Indies, across the Pacific Ocean, and came out over here or underneath the Americas. He sailed around the southern tip of South Africa and back to Spain using a sailboat, no engines. Windmills. Windmills allow people to use the wind's incredible power on land as well. People from Persia, which is modern day Iran, were probably the first to invent windmills well over a thousand years ago. Windmill sails were first made of cloth and then later from wood. They would catch the wind and began to turn. This turning spun the shaft. The turning shaft moved a stone that ground grain into flour. And here's our diagram of an actual windmill. It says the main purpose of the earliest windmills was to grind grain and pump water. So here is the wind shaft here. Here are the sails. And right here is the gear drive. And those sails would spin. And it would turn the gear drive. It would turn the shaft. And then it would crush the grain into flour. And they would collect the grain flour and they would use it to bake. 
Windmills spread across Asia and Europe and later to the Americas. In addition the, to grinding grain, they also powered pumps that drew water from the ground. Using wind pumps helped people settle dry areas in the American West. This picture here shows a historic Canyon Ranch Eclipse Windmill in Pecos County, Texas. It was built in 1898. By the end of the 19th century, millions of windmills were in use around the world. Windmill power helped people cut wood at small mills, at sawmills, and pump water for homes, animals, and crops. This picture is of a windmill and it provides water for steam engines. The trains had to refill their water tanks and they would travel across the country. Electricity from wind. In the late 1800s, people came up with an even better way to use the wind's power. The wind turbine. Hmm. The blades of the wind turbine catch as much wind as possible. As the blades turn, the power of the electric generator and make electricity. The ability of the generator, uh, the ability to generate electricity makes wind turbines even more useful than simple windmills. Instead of doing just one task, the wind turbines can be used to power just about anything. Now down here is an illustration of a wind turbine. Now, wind turbines look like windmills to me, only a little more sleeker, a little more um, small and more compact. So, the wind turbines, it rotates the turbine, which connects to the shaft and spins the generator and makes electricity. So now, they went from using wind to sail across the oceans to pumping water grinding grain into flour, and now into electricity. Hmm. So if we look at our context clues, we've learned that wind can be used for lots of different things. Ooh, wind farms. Today, hundreds, even thousands of wind turbines are built in groups. These wind farms can produce huge amounts of electricity. Most wind farms are on land, but some are built on water. Strong, steady winds from the sea make it a perfect place for turbines to generate electricity. Our picture at the top is the Ginsu Farm in China. It is the largest in the world. Its goal is to produce enough electricity to power a city of 2 million people by 2020. That would be a really good thing to research to see if that farm actually produces enough electricity for 2 million people. I'm going to put that on our list of something to research. And if we look here at the bottom, we have an offshore wind farm in the Baltic Sea near Copenhagen, Denmark. Hmm. Now we live in Arizona, and when you drive to California, and you can see huge wind farms going out toward California. Cleaner energy. More and more of the world's energy is from wind power. Experts predict that by 2050, more than one third of the world's electricity may be generated by wind. Why is the use of wind power growing? Wind is a renewable resource meaning it is a natural resource that can produce energy endlessly without being used up. Wind power is also far cleaner than coal, gas, and oil. So let's go back to this word, natural resource. So if it's a natural resource, that means that it occurs naturally in nature. This word renewable, wind is renewable. It means it is a natural resource and it can produce energy. But renewable means endless without being used up. Wow, that's a good way to clarify when you read on and then you think about what those words mean. And here is a little story 
Here's a text feature inside of our story. Let's read our text feature. The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. William Kamamba grew up in a poor village in Maui, Africa. The area suffered from drought. Some farming was difficult. So farming was difficult. And someone in his village, and no one in his village, had electricity. At age 14, William decided to change the situation. He had read about wind turbines in a library book and set out to build one. He used scrap metal and parts from tractors and bikes. Soon, William's wind turbine gave his family electricity for lights and a radio. He also made a wind pump so his family could have water for farming. Well, William is a definition, a great definition of an engineer. He saw something he wanted to build because he felt it would be useful for his family. So he had two problems that he solved. They had a problem of drought and they had a problem of no electricity. And by him building a wind turbine or windmill, he solved both those problems for his family. And he was only 14. Great job, William. It says the windmill that William made still stands in Maui, Africa. So there's his windmill. And remember, he used old scrap metal and parts of tractors and bikes to make his windmill. I think we can make some windmills, too. We have some things that we can use at home to make a windmill. Problems with wind power. Wind power provides clean electricity, but no energy resource is perfect. Living next to a giant wind farm isn't always fun. Wind turbines can be noisy because of their huge spinning blades. Because of the noise, wind farms are often built far away from where the electricity where the electricity they generate is needed. In some cases, this can make the electricity more sp expensive. Some people think wind farms are ugly and that they ruin the view. Still others object because the blades can kill birds that fly into them. So even though they've solved some problems, especially the problem of generating electricity and then pumping water and also the problem of uh, ele making electricity, there's still some problems. So nothing is perfect. But let's look at how loud wind turbines can be. Down here in our diagram, we have some things that we use pretty much every day. A lawnmower, a blender, here's the wind turbine, a window AC, a refrigerator. And we're going to read this little caption at the bottom. Sound is measured in units called decibels. A wind turbine that is 500 meters from a home and is about five soccer fields away produces roughly the same amount of noise as a refrigerator. So if our wind turbine is five soccer fields away, it sounds like our refrigerator running in our house. So even though it's long ways away and we don't hear it, it's okay for us to generate that electricity. But if you lived right up under a wind turbine, it might be kind of loud. Wind power's future. Wind power makes needed energy and helps create a cleaner planet. The future holds even greater promise. Wind powered inventions include everything from cars to street lights. People are even building wind turbines to harness hurricanes in the future. These turbines may capture the strong winds these storms produce. By catching their winds, the turbines might even weaken these dangerous storms. This could reduce damage and save lives. Inventions from, from wind power are only limited to human imagination. Many years from now, people will keep thinking of new ways to use it. And if you look at our picture, our text feature, it is the Green Bird, a wind-powered land and ice vehicle. It broke the land speed world record of 203 kilometers per hour. So it traveled 126 miles per hour. You guys are future engineers. It is your job to solve the world's problems when it comes to energy and harnessing wind power. There are other things we can do and other ways it can be done. 
All right, scholars, here's the last text feature of our book. It is the glossary. Any of those dark printed words that you wanted to know what the definition was, they're right here in the glossary. To make connections with our text, research and learn more about people's views on the use of wind turbines. Write a letter to a friend explaining your opinion about wind turbines using the information from your research. And to make a connection to social studies, research to learn more about new wind turbine designs. Create a poster of an old and a new design. Include a diagram of each and list how they are similar and how they are different. Share your poster with your family and with your class. Happy engineering, scholars! Hi friends, Mrs. Fletcher, second grade teacher in the Osborne School District, here with some tricky tongue twisters. Why would we want to do tongue twisters, Mrs. Fletcher? Because it helps with our listening skills and our speaking skills, right? So if I said to you something like, how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? You would look at me and say, what? Tongue twisters don't necessarily have to make sense. No, they're just trying to trick your tongue. And if you get really good at tongue twisters, you can listen really clearly and you can speak really fast, but that's not the goal. It helps you enunciate and say your words and helps with your language proficiency or how fluid you are when you're speaking. So it's also fun. So let's do how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood. Great. That's fun. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? You try it. Ready? And yes, I dance when I do it because it makes it easier for me. How much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? Okay, what about Silly Sally sells seashells down by the seashore? We're doing a lot of alliteration, a lot of repeated S, -S, -S, -S sounds, right? So it helps with our, uh, a lot of our, you know, phonemic awareness. That's when you can close your eyes and listen to the sounds. Let's try it. Silly Sally sells seashells down by the seashore. Can you do it faster? Silly sells, well, so, 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 so. Can you do it faster? Silly Sally sells seashells down by the seashore. Ooh, what about faster? Silly Sally sells seashells down by the seashore. Silly Sally sells seashells down by the seashore. Silly Sally sells seashells down by the seashore. Whoo, Mrs. Fletcher. What about a tongue twister that's only two words? How would that even be hard? Try saying toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat. Try it faster. Try it faster. Here we go. Toy boat, 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 toy boat. Do you start saying a different sound? That's why tongue twisters are amazing and tricky. Want some more tongue twisters? Stay tuned. They're coming at you. This is Mrs. Fletcher signing off with our tongue twister trivia. Have a beautiful day. Hello, my name is Mrs. Button and I am the reading specialist at Solano Elementary School in the Osborne District. I'm very excited to be here with you today to read um, some of one of my favorite books. If you were with me last week, I'm going to be reading the same book that I read last week because I just love it and I want to use it again. And so I'm just really excited to be here with you today. So um, something about me is that I, I think I mentioned this last week. I have pets, lots of pets living here in this house with me um, because I love animals and somehow they all just found me and they stayed. So I have two of my friends here with me to read with us today. You can see right here, this one. Her name is LB, but sometimes we call her Dolores. And uh, these pillows are here because she likes these pillows. So I will show her to you here in a bit. Um, I'm gonna let her sleep. She's resting and I don't want to disturb her. Um, my other friend is to my left. I'll show you him now because he's awake. This is my big orange cat. We call him Baki. 
and he's also very excited to be here reading with me today. My cats love to read with me and I love to read, so we spend a lot of good time together. All right, so today we're gonna to work on a strategy that's called questioning. Questioning is asking questions as we read of the information that we're reading. Did you know that you ask a lot of questions every single day? You do. Think about it. What's the last question that you asked? What is the last question that you asked? Who did you ask it to? I know the last question I asked because I just asked you. <laughs> You're asking questions all day long, whether you realize it or not. In your mind, you are asking questions constantly. I wonder what that's happen why that's happening. I wonder what I'm going to do later. I wonder when I'm going to see my friend. I wonder what I'm going to do today. I wonder why she's wearing that. These are all questions that you're constantly asking yourself, no matter what you're doing. If you're watching TV, if you're cleaning something around, around your house, if you're playing video games, you are asking questions. Think about that. Your brain works sometimes automatically without you even really thinking. So today we're gonna to work on thinking about that thinking and that is called metacognition. That's a really big fancy word. But metacognition just means thinking about your thinking. So today we're going to think and ask ourselves, what are we thinking right now? So I'm just gonna show you what it looks like to question as you're reading. And I'm going to read here a little bit and. Pet Dolores before we start. Okay, so we're reading today from this book. It is called Out of My Mind by Sharon M. Draper. And last time we read that the main character is a girl who is almost 11. Her name is Melody, and Melody has a condition uh, that is known as cerebral palsy. And because of her condition, she is not able to speak. She also has limited movement of her body, so she is in a wheelchair. But the big thing that we learned about her is that she's not able to speak. And so sometimes people think she's not as smart as she is because she can't communicate what's going on in her mind. <clears throat> For a long time, it was just me, my mom and dad, and my goldfish, Ollie. I was five years old when I got him, and I had him for almost two years before he died. So now I have a question already. And the question that I'm wondering with that, I'm just going to read that line again. I was five years old when I got him and I had him for almost two years before he died. I wonder how he died. How did our goldfish die? Let's read on and maybe we'll find the answer. Sometimes when we're reading and we have questions, we're able to find the answer in the text. And sometimes they're just questions that we wonder that we never, we never find out. We have to wonder and, and, Try to figure out what we think might have happened. So she had him for almost two years. She says, I guess that's old for a goldfish. Nobody knew Ollie's name but me. That's okay. Ollie had been a prize from a carnival Dad had taken me to, and I think Ollie's life was worse than mine. He lived in a small bowl on the table in my room. The bottom of the bowl was covered with tiny pink rocks and a fake plastic log sat wedged in the rocks. I guess it was supposed to look like something from under the sea. But I don't think there are any lakes or oceans that really have rocks that color. Ollie spent all day long swimming around in that small bowl, ducking through the fake log, and then swimming around again. He always swam in the same direction. The only time he'd changed his course was when Mom dropped a few grains of fish food into his bowl each morning and evening. I'd watch him gobble the food, then poop it out, then swim around and around once again. I felt sorry for him. At least I got to go outside into the store and to school. Ollie just swam in a circle all day. I wondered if fish ever slept. But any time I woke up in the middle of the night, Ollie was still swimming, his little mouth opening and closing like he was trying to say something. One day when I was about seven, Ollie jumped out of his bowl. Do you have a question there? Is a question coming to your mind there? I know it is for me. I'll read that sentence again. and Think of a question that you have about what I'm reading. One day, when I was about seven, Ollie jumped out of his bowl. 
I had been listening to music on the radio. Mom had finally figured out I liked the country western station, and I was in a good mood. The music was sounding orangey and yellowish as I listened, and the faint whiff of lemons seemed to surround me. I felt real mellow as I watched Ollie do his thing round and round his bowl. But suddenly, for no reason I could figure, Ollie dove down to the bottom of his bowl, rushed to the top, and hurled himself right out of the bowl. He landed on the table. He gasped and flopped, and I'm sure he was surpri surprised he couldn't breathe. His eyes bulged, and the gills on his side pulsed with effort. I didn't know what to do. He'd die without water really fast, so I screamed. Mom was downstairs, or maybe outside getting the mail, but she didn't come right away. I screamed again, louder. I cried out. I yelled. I screeched. Ollie continued to flop and grasp, looking more desperate. Ollie needed water. Do you have a question there? Because I know I have a big question coming to my mind, and my question is, oh my gosh, what is going to happen? What is she going to do now? I howled once more, but mom didn't come running. Oops, I lost my place. Sometimes I lose my place when I read, so I have to kind of find it. You Do, do you do that? I'm sure you do. Okay, here we go. I howled once more, but mom didn't come running. Where could she be? I knew I had to do something, so I reached over to the table and stretched out my arm. I could just barely touch Ollie's bowl. I figured if I could get the fish wet at least a little bit, I might be able to save him. I hooked my fingers on the edge of the fish bowl and I pulled. Water splashed everywhere, all over the table, the carpet, me, and Ollie. He seemed to flop a little less for a second or two, and I kept wailing. Finally, I heard my mother thundering up the stairs. When she came through the door, she took one look at the mess and the dying goldfish and shouted, Melody, what have you done? Why did you knock over the fish bowl? Don't you know a fish can't live without water? Of course I knew that. I'm not stupid. Why did she think I'd been screeching and calling for her? She scurried over to the mess, scooped up Ollie, and gently placed him back in the bowl. Then she ran to the bathroom, and I heard her running water, but I knew it was too late. Either because of the time out of the bowl, or because the bathroom water wasn't the right temperature, Ollie didn't survive. Mom came back in and scolded me once more. Your goldfish didn't make it, Melody. I don't get it. Why would you do that to the poor little fish? He was happy in his little world. I wondered if maybe Ollie wasn't so happy after all. Maybe he was sick and tired of that bowl and that log and that circle. Maybe he just couldn't take it anymore. I feel like that sometimes. There was no way I could explain to Mom what had happened. I really had tried to save Ollie's life. I just looked away from Mom. She was angry and I was too. If she hadn't been so slow, Ollie might have made it. I didn't want her to see me cry. She cleaned up the mess with a sigh and left me with my music in an empty spot on my table. The colors had vanished. It was a long time before I was ready for another pet, but on my eighth birthday, my father brought a big box into the house. He seemed to have trouble holding on to it. When he set it, when he set it on the floor in front of me, Okay, so I'm going to pause here. Do you have a question? I know I have a question. I'm wondering what's in the box. What did, what did she get? What did her dad bring her? Okay, so then it says, when he set it on the floor in front of me, out exploded a flash of wriggling gold fun. What do you think it is? There's a question. What is it? A puppy, a golden retriever puppy. I shrieked and kicked with joy. A puppy. The clumsy little dog raced around the room, sniffing in every corner. I watched her every move, loving her right away. After exploring every table leg and piece of furniture, the puppy stopped, made sure all of us were watching, then squatted and peed right there on the carpet. Mom yelled, but only a little. That's when the dog knew she was in charge. She checked out Dad's bare toes, but she stayed away from Mom, who was trying to soak the spot out of the rug with paper towels and that spray stuff she uses in the kitchen. Finally, the puppy circled my wheelchair around and around like she was trying to figure it out. 
She sniffed it, sniffed my legs and feet, looked at me for a minute, then jumped right up into, onto my lap like she'd done it a million times. I barely breathed, not wanting to disturb her. Then, wow, 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 she turned around three times and made herself comfortable. I think she made a noise like a sigh of satisfaction. I know I did. I stroked her soft back and head as gently as I could. I was the one who named her. Mom and Dad kept suggesting dumb names like Fuzzy and Coffee, but I knew as soon as I saw her what her name should be. Do you have a question there? Because I have a couple of questions. Think about your thinking. Use that metacognition. What are you thinking? What questions do you have? So the questions, some of the questions that come to my mind are, what did she name the puppy? And then my other question is, how did she, how did she communicate that to her parents? Because we know that she doesn't speak. So how did her parents find out what she wanted to name the puppy or do they? I pointed to the bowl on the table, which held my most favorite, favorite candies, butterscotch caramel. Oh, that sounds really good. They're soft enough to melt in my mouth so I don't have to chew, and oh, are they delicious. You want to call her Candy? Dad asked. I shook my head no, gently so the sleeping puppy wouldn't wake up. Caramel? Mom asked. I shook my head once more. Why don't we call her Stinky? Dad suggested with a grin. Mom and I just glared at him. I continued to point to the candy dish. Finally, Mom said, oh, I know. You want to call her butterscotch? I wanted to shriek, but I forced myself to stay calm. I tried real hard not to do anything that would knock the puppy off my lap. Uh, I said softly as I continued to stroke the dog's silky fur. I didn't know that anything could be so soft, and she was all mine. It was the best birthday I ever had. Butterscotch sleeps at the foot of my bed every night. It's like she read the book on what a great dog ought to do. Bark only when a stranger is at the door. Never use the bathroom in the house. She got over that puppy stuff. And keep Melody happy. Butterscotch doesn't care that I can't talk to her. She knows that I love her. She just gets it. One day, a few months after I got her, I fell out of my wheelchair. It happens. Mom had given me lunch, taken me to the toilet, and wheeled me back into my room. Butterscotch trotted behind, never in, the, never in the way, just close by me all the time. Mom popped in a DVD for me and made sure my hands were properly positioned so I could rewind and fast forward the film. She didn't notice my seatbelt wasn't fastened, and neither did I. She traveled up and down the stairs doing several loads of laundry. I'm awfully messy. And I guess she had started fixing dinner. The rich aroma of simmering tomato sauce floated up the stairs. Mom knows I love spaghetti. She peeked her head in to check on me and said, I'm going to lie down for a couple of minutes, Melody. Are you okay for a few? I nodded and pointed my arm toward the door to tell her to go ahead. My movie was getting good anyway. Butterscotch sat curled next to my chair. She'd outgrown my lap. So Mom blew me a kiss and closed the door. I was watching something I'd seen a million times, The Wizard of Oz. I think most people in the world can quote sections of that movie, no extra brains required, because it's one of the movies that gets played over and over again on cable channels. But I know every single word of it. I know what Dorothy will say before she even opens her mouth. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Toto. It makes me smile. I've never been to Kansas or Oz or anywhere more than a few miles away from home. Even though I knew it was coming, when the movie got to the part where the Tin Man does that stiff little dance to the music of If I Only Had a Heart, I cracked up. I laughed so hard, I jerked forward in my chair and found myself face down on the floor. Butterscotch jumped up immediately, sniffing me and making sure I wasn't hurt. I was fine, but I couldn't get back up in my chair. Worse, I was going to miss the part where the cowardly lion gets smacked on the nose by Dorothy. I wondered how long Mom's nap would last. I didn't scream like the time Ollie jumped out of the bowl. I wasn't upset, just a little uncomfortable. I tried to flip over, but I couldn't from the position I had landed in. If I could, if I could have seen the television from where I had fallen, I might have been okay on the floor for a little while. Butterscotch makes a great pillow. 
but butterscotch went to the closed door and scratched i could hear her claws ripping at the wood dad wouldn't be happy when he saw that but mom didn't come so butterscotch barked first a couple of tentative yips then louder and more urgent finally she jumped up and threw her whole body against the door making loud thuds she'd bark then thud bark then thud mom couldn't ignore all that racket do you have a question here because i know i've got a couple of questions we've got butterscotch trying to get her mom's attention my big question is what's going to happen is her mom going to wake up what's her mom going to do i'm sure it was only a few minutes but it seemed like longer mom came to the door looking groggy her hair was all messed up what's going on in here she began then she saw me oh melody baby are you okay she ran to me sat down on the floor and lifted me onto her lap she checked everything my arms and legs my back my face my scalp even my tongue i wanted to tell her i was fine all she needed to do was put me back in my chair but she had to do the mom thing and double check butterscotch you're such a good good girl she said as she petted the dog and hugged me tight doubles on the dog food tonight i'm sure butterscotch would have preferred a nice thick bone instead but she can't talk either so both my dog and i get what they give us mom carefully put me back in my chair and made sure my seat belt was latched correctly butterscotch curled up right in front of me making sure i guess that if i slid out again she'd be there to soften the fall that dog is amazing Mom restarted the video from the beginning, but somehow that yellow brick road had lost some of its magic glow. Nobody really gets wishes granted by the great Oz. As I watched, I wondered if I were blown to Oz with my dog, what would we ask the wizards for? Hmm. Brains? I've got plenty. Courage? Butterscotch is scared of nothing. A heart? We've got lots of heart, me and my pup. So what would I ask for? I'd like to sing like the cowardly lion and dance like the tin man. Neither one of them did those things very well, but that would be good enough for me. So that's the end of our chapter. And I'm wondering what questions you have now, what questions are circling in your mind after having read? Questions about what's gonna happen with Melody, what happens with her dog? Um, I have a lot of questions and questioning is a strategy that good readers use. You should be asking lots of questions as you're reading questions in your mind. And again, some of these questions are answered as you read on and some are not. They're meant to be things that the author wants you to wonder and think about. And that's what makes a story great is when it causes us to have these questions and, and wonderings. So it's been really great to read with you today, and I will show you now. She might cry because she's a little bit loud. Here's Dolores. She's been very happy to read with you today as well, and I'll look forward to seeing you again. Keep reading. Good morning. I'm very happy to have you join us today for another read aloud. Welcome to our class. I am Dr. Saunders from Cesar Chavez Leadership Academy, where I teach junior high language arts in the Roosevelt School District. I have a question for you. Do you know who this is? Yes, it is Muhammad Ali, known as one of the greatest sports figures that America has ever produced. He won a gold medal at the 1960 Olympus at the age of 18. He won 56 of his 61 heavyweight fights, 37 of them by knockouts. He was also an activist, even going to jail because of his opposition to the Vietnam War and, being, and refusing to be drafted into the military. He was a noted figure in the civil rights movement and his rumble in the jungle boxing match against George Foreman, yes, the George Foreman that we see on TV today, in 1974 was estimated to have been watched by a billion people, a billion with the B, making it the most watched television broadcast ever. If you haven't guessed by now, 
our story today is a, a story about a boxing match between two friends. This is a short story from the autobiography Down These Mean Streets by Perry Thomas. He shares stories of his life as a Puerto Rican American growing up in Spanish Harlem, a neighborhood in New York City. Today, as I read, I'm going to show you what I do when I get confused while I'm reading. All readers have times when they lose track of what they're reading. We suddenly realize they haven't understood the words. I'm going to stop and ask some questions, perhaps, and model some of the strategies that good readers use to fix up their comprehension when it breaks down. Are you ready? Let's begin. Antonio Cruz and Felix Vargas were both 17 years old. They were so together in friendship that they felt themselves to be brothers. They had known each other since childhood, growing up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the same tenement building on Fifth Street between Avenue A and Avenue B. And a tenement building is a rundown building that is usually lived in by poor families. Antonio was fair, lean, and lanky, while Phyllis was dark, short, and husky. Antonio's hair was always falling over his eyes, while Phyllis wore his black hair in a natural Afro style. Each youngster had a dream of someday becoming lightweight champion of the world. <clears throat> Every chance they had, the boys worked out, sometimes at the boys' club on 10th Street and Avenue A, and sometimes at the pro's gym on 14th Street. Early morning sunrise would find them running along the East River Drive, wrapped in sweatshirts and short towels around their necks and handkerchiefs, Apache style around their foreheads. While some youngsters were into street negatives, Antonio and Felix slept, ate, wrapped, and dreamt positive. Between them, they had a collection of fight magazines, second to none, plus a scrapbook filled with touring tickets to every boxing match they had ever attended and some clippings of their own. If asked a question by any given fighter, they would immediately zip out from the memory banks division, which is how they divide up boxers by weight. So each division is a delimited by the weight of the boxers. Uh, weight, records of fights, knockouts, technical knockouts, and draws and losses. Each had fought many bouts representing their community and had won two gold-plated medals plus a silver and bronze medallion. The difference was in their style. Antonio's lean form and long reach made him the better boxer, while Felix's short and muscular frame made him the better slugger. Whenever they had met in the ring for sparring sessions, the sparring sessions are just practice boxing sessions, it always been hot and heavy. Now, after a series of elimination bouts or matches where the boxers would determine who would go on to the next round, they had been informed they were to meet each other in the division finals that were scheduled for the 7th of August. Two weeks away, the winner to represent the boys club in the Golden Gloves Championship Tournament. The two boys continued to run together along the East River Drive. Well, even when joking with each other, they both sense a wall rise between them. One morning, less than a week before their bout, they met as usual for their daily workout. They fooled around with a few jabs at the air, slapped skin, and took off running lightly along the east, dirty East River Drive edge. Antonio glanced at Phillips, who kept his, Felix, who kept his eyes purposely straight ahead, pausing from time to time to do some fancy leg work while throwing one-twos followed by uppercuts to an imaginary draw. Antonio then beat the air with a barrage of body blows and short, devastating lefts with an overhand jaw-breaking right. Now, let's stop here. I have lots of questions at this point. I don't know much about boxing other than I know two people get in the ring and hit each other. But I know that these are descriptions of the kinds of, of blows that the boxers use. So what I would have to do would be to do a Google search to look up to see what these kinds of, 
of of throws look like. So I would then know what an uppercut uppercut is and a body blow and so forth. So that's one a technique that you can use when you don't understand the jargon that sometimes it's in uh, in stories. After a mile or so, Felix puffed and said, let's stop for a while, bro. I think we've got something to say to each other. Antonio nodded. It was not natural to be acting as though nothing unusual was happening when two ace boom buddies were going to be blasting each other within a few short days. They rested their elbows on the railing, separating them from the river. Antonio wiped his face with his short towel. The sunrise was now creating day. Felix leaned heavily on the river with railing and stared across the shores of to Brooklyn. Finally, he broke the silence. Man, I don't know how to come out with it. Antonio Hep, it's about our fight, right? Yeah, right. Felix's eyes squinted at the rising orange sun. I've been thinking about it too, Payneen, er, buddy. In fact, since we found out it was going to be me and you, I've been awake at night, pulling punches or holding back on you, trying not to hurt you. Same here. It ain't natural to not think about the fight. I mean, we are both Chevrotis, they're championship fighters, and we both want to win, but only one of us can win, and there ain't no draws in the eliminations. Felix tapped Antonio gently on the shoulders. I don't mean to sound like I'm bragging, but I want to win fair and square. Antonio nodded quietly. Yeah, we both know that in the ring, the better man wins. Friend or fro, brother or no, Felix finished for him, brother. Tony, let's promise something right here, okay? If it's fair, Armano, I'm for it. Antonio admired the courage of a tugboat pulling a barge five times is welterweight, and welterweight is one of the size uh, in the division, which is about 147 pounds. It's fair, Tony. When we get into the ring, it's got to be like we never met. We got to be like two heavy strangers that want the same thing, and only one can have it. You understand, don't you? See, I know, Tony smiled. No pulling punches. We go all the way. Yeah, that's right. Listen, Tony, don't you think it's a good idea if we don't see each other until the day of the fight? I'm going to say with my Aunt Lucy in the Bronx, which is another neighborhood in New York City, I can use Gleason Gym for working out. My manager says he's got some sparring partners with more or less your style. So it's a great picture of a boxing ring and a young boxer practicing. Here's a picture of a typical tenement building in New York City. When Felix finally left the theater, he had figured out how to psych himself for tomorrow's fight. It was Felix the champion versus Antonia the challenger. He walked up some dark street, deserted except for small pockets of worried looking kids wearing gang colors. Despite the fact that he was Puerto Rican like them, they eyed him as a stranger to their turf. Felix did a last shuffle, bobbing and weaving while letting loose the turn of blows that would demolish whatever got in his way. It seemed to impress the brothers who went about their own business. Finding no takers, Felix decided to split to his aunts. Walking the street had not relaxed him. Neither had the fight flick. All he had done was stir him up. He let himself quietly into Aunt Lucy's apartment and went straight to bed, falling into a fitful sleep with sounds of the gong for round one. Antonio was passing some heavy time on his rooftop. How would the fight tomorrow affect his relationship with Felix? After all, fighting was like any other profession. Friendship had nothing to do with it. And now, gnawing doubt crept in. He kept negative thinking. Real quick, he, he cut negative thinking real quick by doing some speedy, fancy dance step, bobbing and weaving like Mercury. The night air was blurred with perpetual motions of left hooks and right crosses. Felix, his amigo brother, was not going to be Felix at all in the ring, just an opponent with another face. Antonio went to sleep, hearing the opening bells for the first round. Like his friend in the South Bronx, he prayed for victory via a quick, clean knockout in the first round. 
And remember, a knockout is somebody gets punched and they hit the canvas. Large posters plastered all over the walls of local shops announced a fight between Antonio Cruz and Phyllis Fargos as the main bout. The fight had created great interest in the neighborhood. Antonio and Phyllis were well liked and respected. Each had his own loyal following. Betty fever was high and ranged from a bottle of Coke to cold hard cash on the line. Antonio's fans with the bridal faith in his boxing skills. On the other side, Felix the buyers bet on his dynamite, packed fist. Felix had returned to his apartment early in the morning of August 7th and stayed there, hoping to avoid seeing Antonio. He turned the radio on to salsa music it sounds and then tried to read while waiting for word from his manager. The fight was scheduled to take place in Tompkins Square Park. It had been decided that the gymnasium of the boys was closed was not large enough to hold all the people who were sure to attend. In Tompkins Square Park, everyone who wanted could view the fight, for either, whether from ringside or window fire escapes or tenement rooftops. The morning of the fight, Tompkins Square was a beehive activity with numerous workers setting up the ring, the seats, the guest speaker stand, the scheduled bouts began shortly after noon, and the park began filling up even earlier. The local junior high across from Tompkins Square served as the dressing room for all the fighters. Each was given a separate classroom with desktops covered with masks, serving as resting table. Antonio thought he caught a glimpse of Felix waving to him from a room at the far end of the corridor. He waved back just in case it had been him. The fighters changed from the street clothes into fighting gear. Antonio wore white trunks, black socks, and black shoes. Felix wore sky blue trunks, red socks, and white boxer shoes. Each had dressing grounds to match their fighting trunks with their names neatly stitched on the back. The loudspeaker blared into the open window of the school. There were speeches by dignitaries, community leaders, and great boxers of yesteryear. Some were well prepared, some improvised on the spot. They all carried the same measure of great pleasure and honor at being part of such a historic event. This great day was a new tradition of champions emerging from the streets of the Lower East Side. Interwoven with the speeches were the sounds of the other boxing events. After the sixth bout, Phyllis was much relieved when his trainer, Charlie, said, time change, quick knockout, this is it, we're on. Waiting time was over. Phyllis was escorted from the classroom by a dozen fans in white t-shirts with the word Felix across their fronts. Antonio was escorted down a different stairwell and guided through a roped off path. As the two climbed into the ring, the crowd exploded with a roar. Antonio and Felix both bowed gracefully and then raised their arms in acknowledgement. Antonio tried to be cool, but even as the roar was in his first birth, he slowly turned to meet Felix's eyes looking directly at him. Felix nodded his head, Antonio responded, and both as one just as quickly turned away to face his own corner. Bong, 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 the roar turned to stillness. Ladies and gentlemen, sonoras, sonoras and sonoras, the speaker, the announcer spoke slowly, pleased at his bilingual efforts. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for, the main event between two fine young Puerto Rican fighters, products of our Lower East Side, Los Saida, called out a member of the audience. In this corner, weighing 131 pounds, Phyllis Fargo. And in this corner, weighing 133 pounds, Antonio Cruz. The winner will represent the Boys Club in the Tournament of Champions, the Golden Gloves. There will be no draw. May the best man win. The cheering of the crowd shook the window panes of the old buildings surrounding Tompkins Square Park. At the center of the ring, the referee was given instructions to the youngster. Keep your punches up, no low blows, no punching on the back of your head. Keep your heads up, understand, let's have a clean fight. Now shake hands and come out fighting. Again, here we are with some more boxing jargon. And if you don't understand or know anything about box, boxing, this is a point where you might want to do some research to look up these terms to figure out what it is that you're talking about, keeping your punches up and low blows. I don't know what a low blow is. So I would look it up to find out what that means. 
Both youngsters touched gloves and nodded. They turned and danced quickly to their corners. Their head towels and dressing gowns were lifted neatly from their shoulders by their trainer's nipple hand. Antonio crossed himself. Felix did to say, Bong, bong, round one. Felix and Antonio turned and faced each other squarely in a fighting pose. Felix wasted no time. He came in fast, head low, half hunched toward his right shoulder, and lashed out with a straight left. He missed a right cross as Antonio slipped the punch and countered with one, two, three lefts that snapped Felix's head back, sending a mild shot cursing through him. If Felix had any small doubt about their friendship affecting their fight, it was being neatly dispelled. Antonio danced, a joy to behold. His left hand was like a piston, pumping jazz one right after another with seeming ease. Felix bobbed and weaved and never stopped pouring in. He knew that his long range, he was at a disadvantage. Antonio had too much reach on him. Only by coming in close could Felix hope to achieve the dream of knocked out. knockout. Antonio knew that dynamite that was stored in his amigo's brother's fist. He ducked the short right and missed the left hook. Felix trapped him against the rope just long enough to pour some punishing rights and left to Antonio's hard midsection. Antonio slipped away from Felix, crashing two lefts to his head, setting Felix's right ear to ringing. Bong! Both amigos froze a punch well on his way, sending up a roar of approval for good sportsmanship. So again, this, as I read this, so the author is telling us that these guys were getting ready to throw a punch and then the bell rang and they stopped right there, which is a, a definitely good sportsmanship because you aren't supposed to continue fighting after the bell has rung. Phyllis walked briskly back to his corner. His right ear had not stopped ringing. Antonio gracefully danced his way toward to his stool, none the worse except for the glowing glove burns, showing angry and red against the whiteness of his ribs. Watch that right, Tony, his trainer talked into his ear. Remember, Felix always goes to the body. He'll want you to drop your hands for his overhand left or right. Got it? Antonio nodded, spraying water out between his teeth. He felt better as his sore section was being firmly rubbed. Phyllis' corner was also busy. You got to get in there, fella. Felix trained and poured water over his curly afro locks. Get in there or he's going to chop you up from way back. Bong, bong. Round two. Phyllis was off his stool and rushed Antonio like a bull, sending a hard right to his head. Beads of water exploded from Antonio's long hair. Antonio Hurt sent back a blurring barrage of lefts and right that only meant pain to Felix, who returned with a short left to the head, followed by a looping right to the body. Antonio countered with his own flurry, forcing Felix to give ground, but not for long. Felix bobbed and weaved, bobbed and weaved, occasionally punching his two gloves together. Antonio waited for the rush that was sure to come. Felix closed in and fented or pretended with his left shoulder and then through his right. Lights suddenly exploded inside Felix's hands as Antonio slipped the blow and hit him with a piston-like left, catching him flush on the point of his chin. Batlin broke loose as Felix's legs momentarily buckled. He fought off a series of rights and left and came back with a strong right that caught, taught Antonio respect. Antonio danced in carefully. He knew Phyllis had the habit of playing possum when hurt, to sucker an opponent within reach of the powerful bombs he carried in each fist. A right to the head slowed Antonio's pretty dancing. He answered with his own left and Felix's eye that began right eye that began puffing up within three seconds. Antonio a bit Antonio a bit too eager, he moved in too close, and Felix had him entangled into a rip roaring punching toe-to-toe -to -toe slugfest that brought the whole Tompkins Square Park screaming to his feet. Right to the bodies, left to the head, neither fighter was given an inch. Suddenly, a short right caught Antonio squarely on the chin, his long legs turned to jelly, and his arms flailed out desperately. Felix, grunting like a bull, threw wild punches from every direction. 
Antonio Gragi bobbed and weaved, invading most of the blows. Suddenly his head cleared. His left flashed out hard and straight, catching Felix on the bridge of his nose. Felix lashed out with a haymaker, which is like a powerful punch, right off the ghetto streets. At the same instant, his eye caught another left hook from Antonio. Felix swung out, trying to clear the pain. <clears throat> Only the frenzied screaming of those along ringside let him know that he had dropped Antonio. Fighting off the growing haze, Antonio struggled to his feet, got up, ducked, and threw a smashing right that dropped Felix flat on his back. Felix got up as fast as he could in his own corner. Groggy but still game, ready to continue the fight. He didn't even hear the count. In a fog, he heard the roaring of the crowd who seemed to have gone insane. His head cleared to hear the bell sound at the end of the round. He was very glad. His trainer set him down on the stool. At his corner, Antonio was doing what all fighters do when they are hurt. They sit and smile at everyone. The referee signaled the ring doctor to check the fighters out. He did so and then gave his okay. The cold water sponges brought clarity to both Amigo brothers. They were rubbed until their circulations ran free. Bum, round three, the final round. Up to now, it had been tic-tac-toe, pretty much even, but everyone knew there could be no draw and that this round would decide the winner. This time, to Felix's surprise, it was Antonio who came out fast, charging across the ring. Felix braced himself, but couldn't ward off the, the barrage of punches. Antonio drove Felix hard against the ropes. The crowd ate it up. Thus far, the two had fought with Lucho Corazon, a much heart. Felix tapped his glove and commenced his attack anew. Antonio, throwing boxes caution to the wind, jumped in to meet him. Both pounded away. Neither gave an inch and neither fell to the canvas. Felix's left eye was tightly cold. Claret red blood poured from Antonio's nose. They fought toe to toe. The sound of their blows were loud in contrast to the silence of the crowd gone completely mute. The referee, the referee was stunned by their savagery. Bong, bong, bong. The bell sounded over and over again. Felix and Antonio were past hearing. Their blows continued to pound on each other like hailstones. Finally, the referee and the two trainers pried Felix and Antonio apart. Cold waters was poured over them to bring them back to their senses. They looked around and then rushed toward each other. A cry of alarm surged through the top of the square part. Was this a fight to the death instead of a boxing match? The fear soon gave way to wave upon wave of cheering as the two amigos embraced. No matter what the decisions, they knew they would always be champions to each other. Bong, bong, bong. Ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen, senoras and senoras, the winner and representative to the Golden Glove Tournament of Champions is... The announcer turned around to point to the win winner and found himself alone. Arm in arm, the champions had already left the ring. What a great story. What did you see me do as I read the story and I got to places where it was a lot of boxing jargon and I didn't understand it? I talked about going and doing some research so I could find out what those terms mean. This would help me fix up my comprehension. So this was a story about two friends who had to compete against each other. They had to decide how they were going to handle the competition and their friendship. How do you think they did? I hope you enjoyed the story of two friends. I know I did. Please be safe. And I look forward to our next lesson. watching Phoenix TV's Study Hall, brought to you by District 8 and our partners at Osborne and Roosevelt School Districts. Tune in Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. for more Study Hall. I hope you learned something today and keep up the great work.